to draw away men after them. And so, by the way, the children did very well with their with their verses. And if, if you didn't get your verses here today, your verse memorized today, uh, you can uh, give it to me on Wednesday also. But uh, anyway, uh, but good job on those and the answers. They had good answers for all the questions and uh, everything like that. Everybody did a good job, and I appreciate that uh, memorization. And parents, it's a good thing for us to go over in Bible time every night. We just go over the Bible verses with our children and 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 memorize those verses and and learn them, right? And they'll be very helpful. So anyway, um, we can we're going to look at the apostles and their immediate successors today. What happened right after there? We're going to read some of that, and then I'm going to read to you out of orchards and give you a sense. I might start with orchard actually, and give you a sense of the times a little bit. Of, of what was going on in that atmosphere. It's not much that I'll read out of there, but a little bit out of Orchard's uh, History of the Baptist. And then we'll get into Brother Beller's, and then we'll kind of finish up with um, this theological, Encyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature. Boy, that's long, isn't it? But um, And it's very long, and the print's very small. But So it'll be fun to read. But anyway, I want to read you about Marcio, and I want to read you about a heretic that arose at that time and his heresy that has continued on. And it's very important that we understand this because, you know, right now you see the Jehovah's Witnesses, you see all these other groups, and you wonder, well, are these groups new? Did they just spring up in the 1800s like, like the JWs did and the Mormons did and all that? Well, not really. The spirit of those heretics and the spirit that those people had, those heresies have always been around. Since after the Bible, since after uh, the, the apostles died, those heresies started to arise. And they're just kind of repackaged. They're not really, they're not really new, okay? They, they've been around, but they're important ones to cover. And this prophecy in Jude, now you'll understand why I had you memorize those verses as well. Because when you look at it in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation... It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men, he, he, certain men, and tonight or this afternoon we're going to talk about the creeps. For there are certain men that crept in unawares. These are the creeps. They crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And here's the point that you have to notice, because this is where Marcion, this, this is where these heretics come in at, that we're going to talk about in the second century. A few of these men, and some good ones too as well, but we're going to talk about them. These men, look what it says here, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a denial that takes place. And what you have to understand is it's not a denial as if there was never a Jesus that existed. It's not that way. Now listen, you got the devil's subtle. He's crafty. It's not that Jesus never existed. That's not what they're going to say. This, these heresies have to do with denying the person, the work, the bodily resurrection of Christ, his, his substitutionary atonement, the person of Jesus Christ found in the New Testament. That's who they deny. And the only Lord God, right? They deny him. And how do they do that? Very subtly. Not the way that you would expect them to. Not in an atheistic way, because that would be more honest. No. It's Satan, the way he does things, is more subtle than that. More subtle. So, anyway, we're going we're to look at that here and, and, and kind of read up on that a little bit here. Uh, we won't be in it super long, just in this, in this portion. I'll just read a couple pages of it to you. Um, but it gives you an idea, because Africa was the center for the churches. It was where the expansion of of Christianity came to place where there were where there were churches being 
uh, churches being started and planted and all those things were happening. So let's pray. Father, Lord, help us. Thank you so much, Lord, for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The history of these churches is not to be understood as comprehending the whole of that immense tract of land which extends from the Mediterranean Sea on the north of the Cape of Good Hope on the south, but that past principally, which runs parallel, that part principally, which runs parallel with and borders on the Mediterranean Sea. As to the extent and influence of Christianity on the interior nations of Ethiopia, we have now no means of ascertaining. It is not certain by whom these people were first evangelized. The current opinion is that the eunuch first and afterward Matthias labored in the part called Ethiopia, and that Mark in AD 39 with Simon and Jude preached in Egypt, Memorica, Mar Mauritania, and other parts of Africa. It is recorded that Mark baptized Azubius on a confession of his faith and that this evangelist was martyred by the people of Alexandria. The hostility of the nations to the gospel, the unobtruding a course of the first disciples with the obscurity of those persons who formed the first communities and are probable reasons why the materials are so few respecting the church's first planet. So we don't know. It's because of what happened. They burn. They always burn the writings if they can. It is very evident that the churches of this providence were introduced into notice and brought prominently into history by their association with those learned men whose names are recorded as some of the first corruptors of the gospel. The first and the most fatal of all events to the primitive religion was the setting up of a Christian academy at Alexandria. Well, how about that? How about that? They set up the Bible school in Alexandria, Egypt. What a great place, right? <laughs> that should work out. That would work out well. Nothing will happen there, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Christians had been reproached with illiteracy, and this seemed a plausible method to get rid of the scandal. In 170, this school was first kept by Pantaneus, whom Clement first assisted, and then succeeded as Origen did him. Oh, what a nasty, wicked man he is. He was. In this school, baptism was first associated with a learned education. Here, minor baptism began with young, with young gentlemen under age and afterwards gradually descended to boys of seven years of age, where it stood for centuries in the hierarchies. Here, youths are first incorporated and became church members by baptism before baptism had only signified a profession of the religion at large. In this school, human creeds were first taught and united with baptism. In apostolic days, a simple expression of faith was required of each candidate. But in, in after periods, to accommodate the ignorance of the catechumens, short sentences were drawn up for the candidates to utter. These sentences were in this, in this school improved into a creed or compendium of doctrines, a knowledge of which was thought essential to the catechumens, and the acquirement of which occasioned a delay from 40 days to uncertain years, and some put off the ordinance till the close of life. We know, said Dr. Wall, that everyone repeated the creed at his baptism, either by himself or his sponsors. So you start to see these corruptions that entered in. And as abstinence, prayer, and other pious exercises prepared persons for baptism, it was to answer for such persons as offered themselves for baptism, having attended to these duties or exercises, observes Moshim, that sponsors were appointed. Terrible idea. These exercises of the candidates for baptism were afterward known by the term of exercising him or putting him to his oath, from which oath probably the term sacrament had, had its rise. The evils attendant on the union of Christianity with Judaism, paganism, and philosophy, which was effected in the school, occasioned swarms of dissidents in Africa. Among those who were hostile to the Alexandrian school is to be, the number, is to be numbered Montanius. His aim evidently was to maintain or restore the scriptural simplicity and native character of the religion of the New Testament with a constant reliance on the promise aid of the Holy Spirit. He wanted to return to his simplicity in Christ. He consequently declared himself a mortal enemy of philosophy and religion. <laughs> Amen. He adopted a severe discipline and yet proved very successful in planting many churches whose members were far from the lowest orders over various provinces. He is reproached as a heretic by all state-paid clergy. Wasn't that about right? Isn't that what they always call us? 
those Baptists and Anabaptists, they always say, those Baptists and Anabaptists and Lollards and Donatists and Novatius, they were just a bunch of heretics is all they were. Why? Because they didn't accept Constantine's state church. They didn't accept the money from Constantine to be paid off. By the way, like a bunch of Baptists and Protestants have accepted the money from the federal government who did those PPP loans and sent out all that money, and Rome got $3.6 billion. And then a Baptist historian friend of mine didn't like my post that I had on yesterday that talked about, that talked about uh, uh, Trump and how I said, hey, listen, I don't believe the guy, I don't believe the guy is for religious liberty. I think he's for a church state. And he said, well, give me proof that he was like Constantine then. I said, well, he paid all the churches in the Roman Catholic Church $3.6 billion. Is that proof enough? Crickets. Figured so. Figured so. I wouldn't have said it if I didn't believe it. I wouldn't have said it, would I have? If I didn't see it with my own eyes that he paid these churches off. Whatever happened to Congress shall make no law, and they're not to establish a church. Well, if you give money to a one church, then you're establishing that church. If you take money away from it, then you're taking away from that church, and you're still, you're still establishing another. See, there were Baptists that didn't, there were Baptists in this time that said, no, we're, we're, we don't want Constantine's money. And we don't want you installing bishops. And we don't care if you send those perverts over, over to Africa and you try to bring your perverted bishops over here and they try to tell us what to do. We don't care. We, we're not going to follow them. We're going to put our own men in office. Amen. But the only answer I get from everybody else that says that when I talk about constant. Remember the bar broadcast I did three years ago? Anybody remember it? Anybody remember it? The next Constantine? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was before $3.6 billion was given to Rome because Rome lobbied with those PPP loans. They lobbied Congress. And all of a sudden, the, the Fed comes out and says, hey, churches need to take this money. No, what he was saying was Rome wants this money. So if all you little guys want some cash, well, we'll give it to you. If you little guys want some, we'll give it to you. But the real money is going to mama. It's going to the Scarlet Harlot. That's where the real money's going. Because they owe a lot of money to children, and they're a bunch of pedophiles. So they want their money back that they had to pay out. Is that too real? This is Baptist history. <laughs> I don't know how you could miss that, that, that he's for a church state. When he gave money to all the church, I mean, like, how do you miss that? Like, how do you not? Like, you almost have to miss that on purpose like you want to. But that's okay. They'll make an excuse for it somewhere. But I guarantee you something right now. If I, if I posted something about Obama like that, Every single one of those guys would have been like, that's right, Obama's wicked, he's this, he's that, and he's doing this, and he's doing that, and all those other things, right? They just said it all. If Obama would have tried to give money to the churches, if Obama would have tried to do that, they'd have been like, no, he can't do that, and this is wrong, and that, and all that. But what I was thinking about doing was kind of kind of mean, but I was thinking about switching the names around and putting Obama in the article and posting it up and seeing how many people would trash it. Seeing how many of the same people that defended Trump would bash Obama for doing it. I'm, I'm going to do it sometime. I'm going to do it sometime. Amen. That's right. That's right. Let my people go, right? <laughs> yes. <sighs> That's right. He's going to stop desiring the leeks and the garlics. Is he? And the melons, yeah. See, but Montanists and men like him, they came along and they were like, well, 
I mean, we got to return to apostolic order. We got we got to get back to the we got to get back to the scriptures. We're following all this other stuff. So every time you're going to see a Baptist group arise, understand it's not because they there were never any men doing that. No, no, no. It's because the apostasy kept getting greater and greater and spreading. So these men would stand out and say, I'm not going to be a part of this apostasy. We're not going to accept this. So one man would rise to prominence and they would name their group after that man. They weren't trying to worship the guy. What they were, they just, they were named that because that guy followed the scriptures. So they called them Montanists or they called them wh- wh- whichever group, the Donatists you're going to find out, which is a great group to study. And we're going to study the Donatists. What's that? No, uh, but you're going to we're going to we're going to we're going to uh, study the Donatists sometime soon. That's going to be great. I am so tempted. Very tempted. Where's that at, Jacob? Do you steal my book? How do you know where that book is, Jacob? Because he's got his he's he's got his eye on it. Isn't it right here? Oh, it's over here. Over here. It's red. OK. All right, let me see here. Luke's been moving stuff. All right, Luke. That's why Luke can't be with me now. Um, all right. Uh, no, anyway, it's somewhere in here. But I, I'm, I'm so tempted to read you that book. It's not very long. To read you the hi- most of the history of the Donatists, because that's where the true history, I mean, th- that David Benedict, that's one, of the be- that's one of the best ones I've ever seen on the Donatists. He, he has a good history of it. Uh, Anyway, so but we'll get to them sometime when Pantaneus was called to fill a missionary station in the east Clemens who had been his assistant succeeded to the office of the catechist in the Alexandrian school Clemens was born at Athens and had realized the advantages of early education while he sustained the character of a schoolmaster He directed his attention to the gospel with the newly arranged doctrines of Plato and endeavored through these opposite sources to form an imaginary coalition in order to render learning more palatable to Christians. Situational ethics again. And to meet in part the prejudices of the heathen. So he did essentially what Constantine did. Presiding as Clemens did over the academy, he tinctured the fountain of knowledge with the poison of his system which proved to the most to, of the most serious consequences of the cause of Christianity. The boys under his superintendence were trained to sing his compositions, and a choir of those who were supposed to be pious was appointed in the church resembling the heathen orgies. So what, what, what am I talking about there? Well, basically, that's where your church choirs arose. Right. It is hybrid worship. and They mix the worship, but that's where, like, church choirs arose. Instead of congregation singing together choirs arose now i don't i think all i think people should sing together i think the church should sing together i think it's the assembly of the saints that sing and i don't even think it's wrong to play instruments at the same time while the singing is going on together as a whole congregation worshiping god together amen i'm not much for the special music and the other things and all that i i'm not because i first of all i've seen what it does to young people especially too it lifts their head up so much with pride it lifts anybody up with pride, but it lifts their head up with pride so much. I've watched it happen. However, playing instruments together as an assembly, like if, if there were instrument people had instruments there, playing it together in the assembly, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think it's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's praising, it's praising the Lord, right? It's true worship to God. So there's nothing wrong with that. And I think, I th- I think there's a place for that, right? But This is where some of those things entered in, and it entered in because they were trying to design themselves after the world to make Christianity palatable to the world. What happens? What happens all the time? People really with good intentions sometimes, they they don't realize that their intentions, though they're good, may lead to something bad. Why? Because they take the world's methods. Right, the method matters to God. That's right. They take them and they do that. During his filling this office, he wrote a book entitled The Pedagogue. Jesus was the pedagogue and all the disciples were children. It was really strange the way he wrote it. To support this view, he selected the words 
child, children, little children, little ones, babes, out of the scriptures to prove the character of the true disciples. He calls the Church of Alexandria a choir of infants. For these infants in his instructions were intended as the book is a Christian directory and contains some plain admonitions to avoid the excess in the visible world. The Egyptian symbols expressive of infancy were honey and milk. Clemens would have these symbols given to newly baptized persons to remind them of their infancy and grace. A door was now opened into the church for Jewish ceremonies, Egyptian images, pagan rites, and oriental science, and the following schoolmaster perfects, perfects the system. As there were many persons of narrow capacities, the Christian teachers thought it advisable to instruct such in the essential truths of the gospel by placing those truths, as it were, before their eyes under visible objects of images or images. So they started to use images, and they started to use these other things. Right? They stopped using the foolishness of preach. Well, they didn't stop it, but they added into the foolishness of preaching. They added those things into it. We don't need that, do we? No, we need the Bible. We need God's Spirit. We need people that love the Lord. Amen. That's what we need. Now, now we're going to get into... The some of the men, all right, that arose at this time, and we'll start to talk about that. Uh, J. M. Carroll, who wrote the Baptist Trail of Blood, says this: Following their savior in rapid succession fell many other martyred heroes. Stephen was stoned. Matthew was slain in Ethiopia. Mark dragged through the streets until dead. Luke hanged. Peter and Simeon were crucified. Andrew tied to a cross. James beheaded. Philip crucified and stoned. Bartholomew flayed alive. Mm. Yeah. Thomas pierced with lances. James the less thrown from the temple and beaten to death. And you know why they threw him from the temple, right? Because remember, Satan wanted Jesus to jump from the height of that temple. So they just threw him down. The less. No, that was the other one. Yep. Thrown from the temple and beaten to death. Jude, yeah, because see, when he fell, he just broke his legs and he wasn't dead yet, so they beat him to death. Jude shot to death with arrows. Matthias stoned to death and Paul beheaded. More than 100 years had gone by before all this had happened. This hard persecution by Judaism and paganism continued for, more, more, for two more centuries and yet mightily spread the Christian religion. Why? Because the trail of blood, because it never stops the true faith. Persecution never stops the Lord's church. Amen. Look what happened even in this church. The persecution and things that we had happened to us, what did it do? Only made us stronger. Made us love the Lord more, made us more tender to God, made us more loving to our fellow neighbors, right? Amen. It went into all the Roman Empire. God used the Roman roads. Amen. He used them. He used them for the gospel and for preaching. It went into all the Roman Empire, Europe, Asia, Africa, England, Wales, and about everywhere else where there was any civilization. The churches greatly multiplied and the disciples increased continually. But some of the churches continued to go into error. According to Eusebius, historic church historian, he says this, that Paul preached to the Gentiles and laid the foundation of the churches from Jerusalem round about, even to Elycrium, in evident, it is evident both from his own words and from the account which Luke has given in the Acts, and in how many provinces Peter preached Christ and taught the doctrine of the new covenant to those of the circumcision is clear from his own words in his epistles already mentioned as undisputed in which he writes to the Hebrews of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. But the number of the names of those among them that became true and zealous followers of the apostles and were judged worthy to tend the churches founded by them, it is not easy to tell except those mentioned in the writings of Paul. For he had innumerable fellow laborers or fellow soldiers, as he called them, and most of them were honored by him with an imperishable memorial. For he gave enduring testimony concerning them in his own epistles. Luke also in the Acts speaks of his friends and mentions them by name. Timothy so is recorded. So we see these different men that are recorded in the scriptures of men that 
were after the apostles that came. One of these books is in the gospel, which he testifies that he wrote as those who were from the beginning, eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered unto him, all of whom, as he says, he followed accurately from the first. Because Luke was the one that wrote, he was of Antioch and Paradise, and a physician by profession. I thought he was from Antioch. Amen. It's a good place, that Antioch, wasn't it? That school of Antioch. What a contrast. And what was the school of Antioch? It was nothing more than a church planting station is all. It was church. Amen. It was church. And they had the scriptures there, didn't they? You better believe they did. You got them today because they had them in Antioch. Amen. I got this old book today. I got this King James Bible today because they had, they had the Bible in Antioch and they preserved it. Amen. Come on. You better thank God for that. You got a lot more than they had. You... You, you, don't have to, you don't have to hide yours, although some of you might hide it, put it away, and not read it. Amen. One of these books in the Gospels, which he testifies, so he talked about that. The other book is the Acts of the Apostles, which he composed not from the accounts of others, but from what he had seen himself. I like it because we as we're going through Acts, you're going to start seeing where Luke says things like we and, and, and things like what's it mean because Luke was with Paul. And he's, he's journaling everything as he was with Paul as he went along on his journey. With Paul and his missionary journeys in places that Luke was with him. Right? Like he said, only Luke is with me now. Right? Sometimes he was by himself and it was just him and Paul. Boy, they must have had a time, huh? Think about that. Suffering and going through the things that they did. And they say that Paul meant to refer to Luke's gospel wherever, as if speaking of some gospel of his own, he used the words, according to my gospel. Paul testifies that Cretans was sent to Gaul. Anyway, so I won't read you all that quote because that just deals with the men that were in the New Testament at the time. And we've already we've read those accounts of those men that were there. Uh, and, And Paul, pay attention when Paul when you're in the epistles and Paul starts to mention his fellow laborers and his co-workers, he's sometimes telling you about pastors of those churches and men that he sent out servants that he had sent out. So he's writing that. And he's telling uh, you of the men that came after that he ordained, Timothy and Titus and and Epaphroditus and all those other men. He talks about those are men that followed in the faith. Amen. That's who they were. The churches of the Mediterranean Asia Minor can be found on examination of the Apostle Paul's journey through the book of Acts. Paul wrote letters to these churches, Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossia, and Thessalonica. He left Titus in Crete. We can also see the churches listed in Revelation chapter 2, as recorded by John, the beloved apostle, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. According to the ancient accounts of Eusychus, Thomas, according to tradition, received Parthia as his allotted region. Andrew received Scythia and John Asia, where after continuing for some time, he died at Ephesus. Peter appears to have preached on Pontius, Galatia, Bithynia, Cappadocia, and Asia. So we understand that Thomas, they say, went to India. Peter preached to Parthi- Parthians. Bartholomew preached to, in Arabia. And Mark to Alexandria, Africa, where the gospel spread to Cyrene and Carthage. The gospel is preached in Rome by Paul. So we know when somebody says, well, they didn't have the gospel. Oh, yes, they did. Those men spread the gospel over the known world. And where did it all get spread from? Antioch. What a place that what a place Antioch was. What a church that was. As as God sent men, raised men up, and they pastored, and they and, and they and they sent out men to start churches all over the world. Amen. And and some say the apostles were split apart in different regions, and that's what they did too. They they took different areas and they just went. And I can believe that. I, I don't have any Bible straight for it, but we do know that Peter, where he went, so we do have some understanding of that, that these men were found in different places. And we know Philip the Evangelist, where was he at? Boom, he was gone. Whew. He was ever he, he got around, didn't he? He got around quickly. <laughs> the Spirit of God picked him up and threw him a few miles out of the way and somewhere else and carried him off somewhere else, right? So we know that. Amen. Now, some second century leaders, Clement of Rome is believed to have been the fourth bishop of Rome and served during the last decade of the, of the first century. Around 96, he sent a letter from the Church of Rome to the Church of Corinth. This letter, known as Clement's first epistle to the Corinthians, was a warning against the practices of prostitution connected with the temple of Aphrodite. You see, preachers, they didn't really have to warn people, did they, of that stuff? Yeah. 
because the temple of Aphrodite was there. So what's going on? And what, what was going on there in Corinth? A lot of perversion. So don't think you have it much worse than they did. Right? You live in a city and you live in places where there's pornography everywhere, where there's wickedness everywhere, where there's women half naked running around. Well, the temple of Aphrodite was there and they didn't have clothes on. I'll put it that way. And they were a bunch of pagans. But you know what? God saw those men through and he'll see you through too. Amen? In the letter, Clement expresses his dissatisfaction with events taking place in the Corinth church and asks the people to repent. The letter is important because it seems to indicate that the author was trying to act as a general head of the Christian church centered in Rome. Clement was put to death under Emperor Domitian. Or, yeah, Domitian. Anyway, so that's where he was put to death. It's important because you're going to start seeing a structural change where uh, that metropolitanite spirit starts to come up where they want to pastor more than more than one church and not I, I should say not pat not just pastoring more than one church but trying to control other churches from right rule other churches that were independent bodies Ignatius tradition says Ignatius was one of the little children who came to Jesus in the gospel account he was a disciple of the apostles his name is linked successor to Peter in Antioch. Around 107 during Trajan's persecution, he was taken to Rome and sent to his death in the arena. Numerous letters have been attributed to Ignatius and at least seven are authentic. These have sufficed to establish the God-bearer, as Ignatius is sometimes called, in the, in the front rank of early Christian theologians. I don't know if I have this here. Let me see. I might, because it is really funny. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Hang on a second. Let's see. Let me see if I can find it here. Anyway, I'll keep reading, but uh, it, it is pretty funny what he says to him. Ignatius confronts Marcion, and I can't find that quote. But uh, I, I'm looking for it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a funny quote. Um, let's see. Jacob, what's going on anyway? Oh, yeah, there, here it is right here. Uh, he said to him, oh, it was Polycarp, not, it was Polycarp that said it to him. Uh, Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna who was put to death. He was a very old man, for it was almost 90 years since he had been converted from heathenism. He had known John and is supposed to have been made bishop of Smyrna by that apostle himself, and he had been a friend of Ignatius. So, um, obviously, we're not talking about Ignatius Loyola. We're talking about Ignatius, uh, the disciple of Polycarp. Uh, anyway, Polycarp met Marcion, who we're going to talk about, who was a heretic, and he said to him, and Marcion said to him, do you know who I am? <laughs> and he said, yes, I know you very well, you, f you, you firstborn son of the devil. <laughs> That's what he said to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was pretty funny. Uh, he knew what he was, and he knew what he was going to do. And uh, there's an exact quote, but I can't find it, but it's funny. Jacob, if you know where it is, you can send it to me, but, uh, but it, it, is, it is hilarious. Anyway, Justin Martyr, converted Greek philosopher, began preaching Christ. He wrote an apology, which is a defense of the faith, which was famous in his time. He was martyred in 166 in Rome. 
Now, Montanus was a convert to Christianity who lived in Fergia in Asia Minor during the second half of the second century. He had two followers, Priscilla and Maximilla, were known for uh, preaching the eminent uh, premillennial return of Christ. So there were some that preached the eminent return of Christ. There have always been those that have, and there have been some that did not agree with that. They believed that there were things that should happen first before that came to pass. So uh, you, that difference is as old as probably 100 years after the apostles or 50 years after the apostles or however long it was, the difference uh, from the two in the two um, positions, either whether pre or post-trib. As far as that goes. Um, but anyway, Marcion, though, uh, a wealthy Christian ship owner, came to Rome at about 139 and was one of the first notable heretics. So your question this week, who was one of the first notable heretics? His name is Marcion, a wealthy Christian ship owner. He argued that there were moral contradictions between the. Now, here's where the heresy comes in. And by the way, and I'm going to ask you, what is the heresy what are the heresies that he held to? There are two main heresies that Marcion held to, okay? The, he argued that there were moral contradictions between the Jewish scriptures and Christian belief. The religion based in re re retributive law of the Old Testament could have no similarity to the religion of the love of the New Testament. What is he saying? He's saying that there was a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament, and they were not the same. That's what he was preaching which is heresy. Marcion identified these differences in a word called antithesis, which, co which made contradictory statements made about the God of the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian God. In 144, he was excommunicated from the church in Rome and established a separate church. During the second century, the Marcion Marcionites were seen as a ser serious rival to the mainstream church. However, the movement fell into rapid decline during the third and fourth centuries, and by the fifth century had largely disappeared in the west. In the east, particularly Syria, the church continued to flourish, surviving until the 10th century. Marcion and his followers believed that there were two gods, the God of wrath and vengeance of the Hebrew scriptures and the God of love and mercy revealed through Jesus Christ. There's a lot of modern day groups who believe that who believes that now? Who have you heard that believes something like that? Jehovah's Witnesses, right? They believe a form of that, don't they? There's other ones. Jacob, who's the other ones that believe that? That heresy. Yep. Yep. Most, most word of faith, they believe, they, they believe those. Instead of believing, what's the right way to believe? What do we believe the Old Testament scriptures do? Say, yes, that's right, brother. You do have to understand the difference in dispensation. That's correct. And you have to understand that, what's that? Right, that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That's what the law does. It's the same God. God's still righteous. See what happens. Let's talk about that for a second, and then we'll re I'll read the rest of the history of that. But let's talk about the dangers of that, of, that f of that heresy because it's important that you understand the dangers in that because if you think that the God of the, New Test the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament or you think that, that the God of the Old Testament was a, a big, mean bully and the God of the New Testament was nice, then your gospel gets really confusing. Yep. Yep. Yep, and that's the God, that that is Marcionites. That's where that came from. It came from right there. That's the teacher that they write, and it's heresy. Because the God because Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. Sure they do. But they're heretics because they're they're wrong about the Godhead. Okay, so uh, let's see. I need a boy to answer me. What Bible verse that we read explains that heresy or uh, corrects that heresy? Who knows it? Which boy? Raise your hand. Which one? Yeah, which one is that? Which verse? Yeah, what did they deny? That's right. There you go. 
the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, if you're wrong, if you're preaching a different God, then you're denying the God of the Bible. You don't get to make up God in your pocket. You don't get to form God out of clay. He formed you out of clay. You don't get to make a God of your own choosing. You don't get to pick one out of the chambers of your imagery and make him up. He's got to be the God of the scriptures. And what did Jude say? No, they're not going to say there is not one. No. They're going to arise and they're going to deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to deny the Father. What are they saying about him? They're saying, well, he's not. That's not the God of the... I mean, the God of the Old Testament is different. I've heard people on the street when I'm preaching, well, that sounds like you're reading in the Old Testament. You need to quit that, loser. Hey, loser, you need to quit reading out of that Old Testament. This is New Testament times. Well, it is. But we also know, but I can show you that it's the same God from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. God didn't change. God changes not. Therefore, his sons of Jacob are not consumed. God doesn't change. Right. Right. Yes, that's. No, he's not. Right. But his righteous. His, but listen, God is God is righteous and God is whole. The number one attribute of God is his holiness. And his holiness is never compromised. Okay, who can answer this question? Why is God's, which one of you men, I want to I, I want to call a man here to answer this question. Which one of God's uh, attributes, or, or how is it that God can still be righteous and, and save sinful man? How is it? How is God's righteousness completely fulfilled and not one ounce of God's righteousness or his wrath? was withheld or changed, right? He is just, but why can he save man and be the same God that he always has been? Why is he the same? Why, how, how is it, in other words, how is it that, what's that? Immutable, right. My point is this, legally Christ bore all my sins. God spared not his own son. So then all of God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. That's, go ahead, brother. Right. 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 Right, saved by grace. That's right. Amen. That's right. I still have flesh that I battle with, but I'm but I'm not I'm not counted as a sinner any longer. That's right. Amen. That's right. That is performed, that is possible by understanding the atonement. Once you understand the atonement and you understand that all of God's wrath was poured out legally, not one bit of God's righteousness. What I'm trying to get at is not one bit of God's righteousness was compromised to save your soul. Do you understand that? No. Yep. 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 Yes. Right. Because it only worketh effectual in them that believe. That's why. They must turn. Right. Right. They apply it to them without repenting, without trusting Christ, without putting their faith and trust in Christ. See, here's the problem. What happens is people, when they, when they look at, and, and this is what happened to Marcion, he couldn't see that, well, I see the grace of Christ, so I can't believe. How can I believe that God's righteousness, that the, that's the same God of the Old Testament? Well, because, it, by the way, you want to know what book Marcion, what main book, Jacob, maybe you can guess this, since you're over there blowing bubbles with your son. Maybe you can guess this. Um, uh, Jacob, what main book do you think Marcion rejected in the New Testament? Yeah, which one in particular do you think he rejected more than any of them? Nope. No, Hebrews. 
<laughs> now, why? Who knows where I'm getting, I'm going with this. Why did he reject Hebrews? Because if you understand, if you read Hebrews, it explains the entire Old Testament to you. All the sacrifices, it, it teaches you Christ better than all. And it shows you that the presence of Christ, the, or the picture of Christ, was there all the way through the Old Testament. All of those things were shadows and types of what was to come. And that they all pictured, imperfectly pictured, Christ. That's why. So that's why a man will reject Hebrews like that because, well... Hebrews explains the entire Old Testament masterfully, by the way. Yes, it shows faith in the Old Testament. It shows that it shows uh, God's God's mercy and grace. See, that's why he rejected it. He couldn't he couldn't believe that was real. And he and he rejected uh, many of the epistles there that were there as well. So. uh Because Jesus could have nothing in common with this evil material world, what else did they believe? Uh, They believed. Now, here's the other one I want you to write down. Uh, His other heresy. His human body was apparent, not real. His heresy is human body. What's that? Right. Well, he said, reach hither thy hand into my side. Can a spirit do this? He explained it. Now, question for you. What other major what other major cult today denies the bodily resurrection of Christ? Anybody know? There you go. They deny the bodily resurrection of Christ. Oh, his spirit did, but not his body. Where'd that heresy come from? Right there. Right. That's what they're saying. So you have to understand that there were that there were that these people I'm going to read you out of this here a little bit more on Marcion so you understand the impact that he had. OK, you have to understand something. These heretics that arose like Marcion, they did a lot of damage because some of them were like able writers and they would and, and, and they were they, they hurt a lot of people. And they are still hurting a lot of people today because heretical writings seem to just live on and on and on and on. Right now, the scriptures have dwarfed them, but good writings of good men you can't find, but you find those heretics' writings. Why? Because they burn the other ones. That's the truth of the matter. I want to give you a little bit more about Marcion, though, here, because, and the reason I want to give you that is because he was a big a, a big player in that, okay, in, 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 uh, in the second century, and we are going to close out the second century today here, and... Um, and we'll be starting the third century. But uh, it's interesting. There's these these guys are usually foul characters in a lot of ways. But uh, Marcion was the founder of the sect of the Marcionites, flourished near the middle of the second century. He was a native of Sinope. According to Tertullian, he was a pilot. Some critics have expressed their doubts that so learned a man should have followed such a trade. But nothing proves Marcion having been a very learned man. He seems to have at first connected himself with Stoics. And although his father was a bishop, he long inquired into the merits of Christianity before becoming a convert to it. So his father was a bishop. So that don't save any, any church, any, any, any pastor's children. You need to be saved by the grace of God and follow the word of God. Amen? You don't get saved for who your daddy is unless it's the father in heaven. He has either retained some of his former views. Okay, it says here that he long inquired into the merits of Christianity before becoming a convert. Um. To it, he either retained some of his former views or else indulged in new speculative views, which caused him to be excommunicated of, by his own father. So his own dad excommunicated him. Epiphanius, who states that Marcion was driven out of the church for having seduced a young girl. Now, some people say it wasn't true, but I don't know. His father kicked him out. He must have done something. Uh, anyway, afterwards, affirms endeavored to regain admission into it uh, by affecting to be deeply penitent, but his father refused to admit him again. <laughs> his dad's like, I don't believe you. <laughs> well, you know what? His father probably knew him, right? Marcion now went to Rome, where he arrived, according to Tillamont, on according 
uh, or according to Lisbeth, in uh, 143 or 144, but more probably in 138, as St. Justin mentions his residence in Rome in his Apology, written in 139. According to St. Epiphanatus, Mar Marcion's first step upon reaching Rome was to ask readmission into the church, but he was refused. <laughs> no way. <laughs> the same writer further states that Marcion aimed to succeed uh, Pope Hyginus, who had just died, and that his re regret at having failed was the cause of his accepting Gnosticism. And that's what he was, was a Gnostic. His views were mixed with Gnosticism. These Oriental doctrines were then preached at Rome by a Syrian named Serdan. Marcion joined him and proclaimed his intention of creating an abiding schism in the Christian church. Quite different in it is the statement of Epiphanius. Marcion says he was at first received in the Church of Rome and professed first orthodox views, but being a, of a speculative turn of mind, his prying, theorizing intellect constantly led him to opinions and practices too hostile to the opinions and practices of the church to escape opposition, and he was therefore constantly involved in controversy in which he often espoused heretical views. So he was a heretic. After repeated warnings, he was finally cut off from communion with the church. In perpetuum. He continued to teach, still hoping to become reconciled with the church. Finally, he was offered reconciliation on the condition of returning with all his followers, but died while endeavoring to do so. His disciples were then but few and did not hold all the doctrines afterwards maintained by the Marcionites, who flourished as a sect in spite of the untold persecution until the 6th century. All right, the fundamental point of Marcion's heresy was a supposed irreconcilable opposition between the Creator and the God of the Christians, or in the other words, between the two religion systems, the law and the gospel. He was just a confused dude. Because when you're saved by the grace of God, you, you're not very confused. Even Peter got a little confused for a while, but he got it right. He responded, didn't he? His theological system is but imperfectly known. Epiphanius accuses him of recognizing three first principles, one supreme, ineffable, and invisible, whom he calls good, Secondly, the creator. Thirdly, the devil or perhaps matter or source of evil. According, and that's, that's Gnosticism. That's what that is. He admitted three, the good, the God, and the matter. Okay, it is proved that Marcion believed in the eternity of matter, but it is uncertain whether he considered the creator as the first principle or as in some degree an emanation of the good God. It's Gnosticism. That's what that is. At any rate, he considered them as essentially antagonistic. This conclusion he arrived at because he could not find in the Old Testament the love and charity manifested in the gospel of Christ. But you can see the love and charity of God even in the Old Testament. You can see it. But love and charity is found in Christ. Amen. That's right. He therefore made the creator, the God of the Old Testament, the author of evil. Malorum factorum, by which he meant suffering, not moral evil. The old dispensation was, according to his views, the reign of the creator who chose the Jews for his own special people and promised them a Messiah. Listen to this. Listen. Christ is not the Messiah, but the son of the invisible good God and appeared upon earth in human form, being perhaps but a phantom. Okay, so what part of that verse is that heresy, is, is that heresy corrected by? Or what were we, what did they prophesy about? Denying what? The only what? And? There you go. This is the denial of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did John warn us of? Who remembers what the Apostle John warned us of? That if you deny that you are Antichrist, if you deny that what? That's right. There you go. If you deny that Jesus came in the flesh, they are antichrist. What did he deny? That Jesus came in the flesh. Yeah, he's denying it. What does the Bible say in the Old Testament? Prophesied that Jesus, but a body hast thou prepared for me. Right? So then Marcion also rejects Hebrews which quotes that verse and quotes much of Psalms. Amen. He said, upon the earth in human form being, he said, being perhaps but a phantom, that he wasn't 
He just appeared that way. He was a phantom. To free the soul and overthrow the dominion of the creator. Yes, it is. Marcion also supposed that when Christ descended into hell, he did not deliver those who in the Old Testament are des designated as saints, such as Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David, etc., but rather those who had disobeyed and rejected the Creator like Cain, Esau, Korah, Dothan, and Abraham. <laughs> yes, it does. Right. And where does it say that? In Hebrews. Right. And in Hebrews. Right? Who is the image, of, and in Colossians, who is the image of the invisible God. Right? Who upheld all things by the the word of his power. I think about that, and I can't explain all those things in science that they all want you to explain what gravity is, what this is, and what that is. All I know is that God holds it all up by the word of his power. That's what I believe. I believe, but sci I don't care. If science disagrees with God in any way, then science is wrong. No, they can't. They just act like they can. But I'm going to tell you what, you know what this whole thing's held together by? Christ. That's what it's held together by. That's my answer. Amen. Right. Yep. I like this. I'm going to read this to you, Hebrews, and then we're going to finish up with this, but I want to read this to you. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory. Say, yeah, there you go. And the express image of his people say, well, what was that light? God said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, God is light. God is light. But that was before the sun. That doesn't matter. God's light. There's no darkness in him. Who, who is the light of the world? Jesus. Yes, it is. That's right. That's why the Old Testament calls him the sun, S-U-N of righteousness, right? That rises with what? Healing in his wings. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. There it is. I can't explain gravity. I can't. It's right there. You can call it whatever you want. I don't care what you call it. But I, I call it Christ holding up everything by the word of his power because that's what Jesus said. So then if you want to, if you don't like geocentricity, you don't. You don't like science then. People laugh at you when you talk about geocentricity, right? They'll laugh at you, right? Yes, they did. But it says here, who being the brightness of his glory, right? And the upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down to the right hand of majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels. What does that made mean? That means that that's ta not talking about him being created as a as he was never there. It's talking about his incarnation. Every time you see that, it's dealing with his incarnation. What is he dealing with here when he talks about the order? He's talking about his incarnation into the world. That's, that's what he's talking about. It's easy. It's not hard. You got to make it hard. That's what the heretics do. They like to make it hard. Marcion also supposed that when Christ descended into hell, he did not deliver. Anyway, we talked about that. So he delivered all the bad guys, but not the true saints. <laughs> right? Uh, that's weird, isn't it? The other doctrines of Marcion were the natural consequences of these principles. He disapproved of marriage. Okay, what Bible verse talks about that? You know, yep, Paul talked about that. Do you know what verse that is? No, nope. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number... Right now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Right? Speaking lies and hypocrisy. And he goes on forbidding marriage and commanding to abstain from meats. So he disapproved of marriage. Why? Well, he was a heretic. He was a rebel. He hated God. He hated God's order. He didn't understand it. And did not admit married persons to baptism. 
considering it wrong to propagate a race subject to the cruel dominion of the Creator. His disciples convinced that this world is a prey to evil, hailed death, even a martyr's, as freeing them from it. They denied the resurrection of the body, and notwithstanding Epiphanius' assertion, it appears doubtful whether they believed in the transfiguration of the soul. So what do they say? What were they saying when they not, they say you soul sleep? I had some guy tell me that last week on the street. I know this is going longer than I thought, but I'm having fun. Um, they, 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 they say it was soul sleep. Remember that guy told, well, you don't, there's no hell. You just go to sleep. Yeah, and you just don't get raised up again, that's all. They were in the habit of being baptized several times as if the sins of every day diminished the effects of that sacrament, as they called it. But this custom, which is not mentioned by Tertullian, was probably introduced after the death of Marcion. Women were a lot, listen to this. Is there any wonder this guy was a rebel? I mean, he just was. When you're wrong about that, you get crossways about everything. It just happens. Listen to this. Women were allowed to baptize persons of their sex, and new converts were admitted to witness the mysteries. To make the scriptures agree with his views, Marcion rejected a large portion of the New Testament. Well, of course. He looked upon the Old Testament as a revelation of the creator of the Jews, his chosen people, which not only differed from, but was entirely opposed to Christianity. But it wasn't. It was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The Bible says we're to be thankful for those oracles that were given. Amen. He admitted but one gospel and that a truncated, truncated, sorry, truncated version of Luke's, the first four chapters of which he rejected, making it commenced by the words, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, God came to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and spoke, to the, and spoke on the Sabbath. He carefully omitted all the passages which Christ acknowledged the creator as his father. Among the epistles, he admitted those to the Romans, 1st and 2nd to the Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Philemon, and some part of the supposed epistle of Paul to the Laodiceans. But all these epistles were expurgated and interpolated to suit his views. Well, that sounds pretty normal to modern-day heresy, doesn't it? Marcion also composed a work called Antithesis and is a collection of passages from the Old and New Testament, which he looked upon as contradictory. In reality, the system of Marcion bore a close resemblance to that of Mani. It was an attempt to explain the origin of evil. Marcion is afterward, after two principles, but there is the essential difference between them that while Marcion based his system on the scriptures, interpreted with daring subtlety, he derived it from Parisium without direct reference to Christian dogmas or tradition. So anyway, those men stood against him. Now you know why Tertullian looked at, or not Tertullian, but Polycarp looked at him and told him that he was, he was what? Firstborn son of the devil. And you think we're harsh sometimes. Right? That's what he said to him. Anyway, all right, so that concludes the second century. And uh, so those questions on uh, notable heretics there. All right, and let's see here. I want to give you a Bible verse here. Let's see. Why don't we, why don't you do Hebrews chapter one? I think you can do verse one. And two. One and two. You can you can handle that. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers, by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Amen. I think you can do those two. All right, let's do that. And then those questions are what were the two major heresies? Or who is the her who is the main heretic of the second century? And what were his two main heresies? All right. So that should be that should be good for this next week. And then memorize Hebrews chapter one, verse one and two. OK, let's take a break here. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for this history, Lord, that we have. 
And thank you for the truth of scriptures that decides all of our doctrine, not the way we feel or not the things that we think that we can explain naturally or try to explain outside of the scriptures. May all of our understanding be submitted to the authority of Christ in his word. And may we cast out imaginations in every high thing that exalted itself against, above the, against the knowledge of God and bring every thought into captivity of the obedience of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you. Uh, bless the rest of the time we have here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.